Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our sixth and final webinar in our Return to Play webinar series. Thank you for being with us today. Our series is designed to help give coaches, trainers, athletes, and others in the exercise science field the knowledge they need to help keep their athletes or themselves safe and healthy as they return to play post-pandemic restrictions. Today, we'll be hosting a roundtable discussion titled Nutrition Strategies to Reduce Injuries and Facilitate Healing with Professors Tavis Butoli and Joanne Villafor. A little about our presenters, Professor Tavis Butoli is a co-founder of My Sports Dietitian, an online sports nutrition education company, and is a sports dietitian of 20 years himself, having worked with professional sports teams, collegiate programs, and high school programs. He has his bachelor's in nutrition and dietetics and his master's in kinesiology, and is a licensed dietitian. He's also an instructor at Concordia University, Chicago. Professor Joanne Villaflor is a current performance enhancement dietitian for the U.S. Navy Command headquartered in Washington, D.C. She was the prior U.S. Army 75th Ranger Regiment Tactical Performance Dietitian embedded supporting special operations forces. She has 19 years experience as a registered dietitian and her bachelor's in dietetics and a master's in clinical nutrition. She recently completed coursework for a PhD in health and human performance at Concordia Chicago, where she also serves as an instructor. A little information about Concordia University Chicago, which is one of our hosting universities for our series. Concordia offers bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs in exercise science. The courses are 100% online and asynchronous, which means you can balance work, school, and your family or personal life. You can complete your master's in 12 to 18 months. There's 50% transfer credit available for students, and CUC has a tuition guarantee, which means your tuition won't change on you while you're studying with them. If you're interested in any of these programs, please feel free to message me directly. So the way our roundtable will run today, we will discuss four different topics. Nutritional needs of athletes, nutrition for recovery, nutrition for body recomposition, and supplements. Within these topics, we'll touch on specific themes and we'll take questions from the audience as they come up. Please feel free to unmute and speak up directly. You may use the chat, but we really want to encourage an open discussion here. And of course, please keep the questions related to the topic and all conversation respectful and relevant. With that, let's kick things off with nutritional needs of athletes and I'll pass things over to Pat and Joanne. Naomi, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here and looking forward to hopefully providing a lot of valuable information for those that are in attendance. Um, I'm gonna say ladies first. So I'll, Joanne, do you wanna take this first one or do you wanna, and I'll, I'll kind of maybe piggyback on that and we can kind of go from there. Sure, thanks Tavis. And thanks to Concordia University for allowing us this time to spread our knowledge and apply some of this information. I think some things to think about is, okay, when you look at nutrition playing a role in athletes' optimal performance, first we gotta determine what is their, their fundamental understanding of, and knowledge of nutrition and where do they wanna go from there? What are their goals? And I get, you know, the fall season coming around. I think Tavis, you experience this regularly. We have a lot of young athletes out there that are beginning their workouts and their practices in order to prepare for the upcoming season. So really going into the school year, I spent a lot of the time going from one sport to another sport. And what we're seeing is a lot of limited time to rest and recover. And most importantly, how to feel the body properly. So many athletes struggle to achieve whether it's their weight goals or fueling properly for that particular sport, especially if they're cross training into other sports, we have to really just think about first, where's the health and well being of our athlete at, at a baseline. So we've got to fix first, if anything, making sure that they have a really balanced diet, um, that the foods that they're consuming are meeting their fluid, their macro and their micronutrient intake. Then we can consider the sports foods and then if really needed, then we can look at the dietary supplements. But really it's that, where are we with the baseline for our athletes to optimize their performance in that food first approach? What do you think, Tavis? Yeah, the only thing I wanna add is performance is a big puzzle, right? There's so many things that can impact performance, but to me, the key catalyst, and yeah, I'm a little biased being a dietitian, is really nutrition because you can, you can strength, I mean, strength training, sleep, even equipment can enhance performance. There's so many factors, genetics, you have to have a good skill set. 
you know, as an athlete, you can't be a bad athlete. And all of a sudden we feed you good food and you become a great athlete. We can help you enhance that. But it all really starts with nutrition. Without the nutrition piece, none of the other pieces of the puzzle fall into place. You can't go into a game or a match or an event under fueled and expect to do well. So really when, when I work with athletes, I, I show them, they mostly come to me after they realized wow, nutrition, this is an important piece of the puzzle. It's why people are now investing millions of dollars into nutrition resources at the NFL level, Major League Baseball, NBA, college sports now has multiple sports dietitians for their team. They realized, okay, if our athletes are well taken care of with athletic training. They're well taken care of in the strength room, but we're not feeding them enough. So they, they're injured more often. And you know, I know we'll talk about that. So really nutrition is the catalyst that makes everything else fall into place and truly optimizes performance. Now, I guess that leads into that next topic because we look at, you know, the prevention or just the, the injury. I mean, nutrition is a pretty critical role when it comes to that. Now, can we, it's hard to say prevent, right? That prevent word is kind of a dangerous word. We got to be careful with saying this and that. We have seen some science with adequate vitamin D levels. If, if an athlete looks at adequate vitamin D, they have less risk for injury. They, they did a study with NFL athletes and it saw less fractures, less bone stress fractures. Um, so what we do know is, on the treatment side, um, there are some, some key nutrients when it comes to things that can help actually help tissue recover, reducing inflammation. So nutrition does play a pretty big role, you know, in that component, whereas if an athlete does get injured, yes, we want to really focus on honing in on adequate calories, adequate protein, specific vitamins and minerals that can maybe help the recovery process. You know, there's certain things I, I know when we get to supplements, I'll mention some things that I always recommend my athletes take in regards to just general health and wellness, but they also have anti-inflammatory properties. Yeah. And I'll add to that, Tavis. I think whether you're on this webinar as an athlete yourself, or maybe as a strength and conditioning coach and ATC, or maybe someone else in the health field, the single most contributing factor to poor athlete health and recovery is, and I, Tavis, you'd have to back me up or support or not, under fueling, under fueling, under fueling. It is so important that we make sure our athletes are getting their caloric needs met and they're getting all their nutrition met on the macro micro side. And this leads into their immune function and their health. You know, you think about infection in athletes during the common cold season right now, of course, we've got the Delta variant, poor hygiene, you know, air travel, life stress, depression, anxiety, low energy availability, bad sleep, and just so maybe their training load is contributing to them going down that spiral of getting injured or having um, potential illnesses. So I think under fueling is not emphasized enough. I agree hundred percent. I mean, I, when I was at the collegiate level, we saw on the, especially on the cross country side, a lot of athletes had this mindset that lighter is faster. So if I'm, if I can lose five or 10 pounds, I can run further and run faster. And that's completely false. I mean, it really depends on the sport and where they are currently when we do that assessment. But in some cases that will lead to a higher risk of stress fracture, putting more stress on the bone under fueling, as Joanne mentioned that if you're not getting adequate calories, you know, it's almost like saying, Hey, I'm not going to put a lot of gas in my car today. And I'm going to try to drive for them. Mm -hmm. I'm based out of new Orleans. So I'm, I'm going to try to try to drive from new Orleans to New York on one tank. Yeah. That's not going to happen. So it's adequate. And there's a lot of fear of eating in some places to where we don't, we're just scared to eat certain things because of what we've heard or read or, you know, what we've heard in the media. And unfortunately that translates to you know, our real life practical intake. And for athletes, that could be detrimental because some of these things we see being promoted, you know, throughout different, different uh, channels is really unsafe for an athlete to follow. Sure. And I still don't have anything in the chat, so we can continue on with the next question. Tavis, how do you assess the nutritional needs of your particular athletes in your population? Yeah. So, I mean, the majority of the, the, the athletes I'm working with now, I really like focusing on a high school athlete. That is just an area where there's so much opportunity to kind of change behavior because they just, they don't understand nutrition. They don't value it yet. It's a not, it's like mom and dad says, Hey, you got to do this. And they're like, Oh, you know, and I, I played high school sports. So I get it. I, I just ate, 
So a couple of things I really do. Number one, I, I look at three really main things. Um, obviously, a food log is going to be important for me to understand what, when, and how much an athlete eats. But before I do that, I want to look at a few other things, too. I want to look at medical background. I want to look at you know any type of food allergies, uh, a, a few questions about their diet in regards to when are they the most hungry or hungriest part of their day? Um, you know, are they are they're eating when they're bored or are there other times when they eat when they're not hungry? Also, how many meals a day they're eating? Also want to look at activity. So I have, a, I have every athlete pretty much fill out an activity log because it's not a one calorie fits all approach. That's the one thing with athletes that it makes no sense to have them eat the same amount of calories every day. If they are moving for three hours one day, let's say they have an hour of strength and conditioning in two hours of football practice or whatever sport it is versus let's say Sunday, they're going to sit around and rest. Well, they need to eat a lot more on the days they're doing three hours of movement versus the days they're just resting. Um, so I want to assess and kind of determine what's their output, what's their average output. But, you know, when I design their plan, some days they're going to get more and some days they are going to get less. And then the last piece is that, you know, that basic nutrition assessment, medical history, things like that. And that way I can, when I'm consulting and looking at their food log, then I can pretty much identify what habits they're missing. The goal is not to get them on any type of special. It's more about, hey, you haven't eaten breakfast for four days in a row. Let's just start eating breakfast. So it's with a young athlete, it's, it's really important to keep it simple because if you overwhelm them, it's going to be really hard for them to understand how to do this the right way. I agree. And I have a little bit of a different population with the military and the tactical side of the house. And I look at low energy availability, especially for our females. And so you're looking at a population where they're not, they're out of high school, and, but they're still within the 18 to 24 year old range is our typical recruit into the military. And so when our, especially females, they go in and they feel like they need to drop weight. And so their energy availability is so low that it's less than say like 30 calories per um, their fat, per fat free mass of kilogram of fat free mass. So um, when I look at that, or when I look at some of our, the, the gentlemen that may go into an assessment and selection school and how, you know, we worked with the Rangers where we've seen them lose, you know, over 30 pounds just from a 90 day school. So, I mean, it gets pretty extreme. And I think also one thing besides just nutritional needs of an athlete, um, them, whether they're skipping breakfast or they're just not getting enough to eat, I always ask them about sleep. Sleep is so important for, for recovery. And we fail that, you know, at that in life, right? We don't put away our technology. We don't prioritize sleep. We always feel that there's more than 24 hours in a day and we just try to cram it in. It's almost like the busier we are, the, the better we are in society. But in reality, we just need more sleep. So whether it's our athletes sleeping in on the weekends or even myself doing that, just consider whether whether whatever time we might wake up that you eat that first meal right away within that hour that you consider making sure that your protein needs are met throughout the day and sometimes it's just going to bed an hour earlier on the weekends 100 percent. i mean sleep sleep is i'm no sleep expert you know but it's one of those things i've i've been in and spoken at conferences with people that specialize in that and i'm like wow some of the things you've learned like hey set your temperature to 68 degrees and i was like yes I can come home and tell my wife that, hey, we can turn this thing down a little bit because that's that's going to help me sleep a little better. <laughs> so, yeah, sleep is it's one of those underrated things we don't think about. And, you know, technology is consuming so much of our time to, to capture that sleep time. So I see that the next question we look at any questions, I guess, so far from our audience our attendees. OK. So nutrition needs, do they change based on the type of athlete sport? Yeah, I mean, really, nutrition needs will, will change based on volume. So I don't think the sport is, you know, some sports, yes, they're going to burn more calories than others. And, you know, an athlete that's doing three or four hours of intense movement, whether it's basketball, volleyball, whatever, that's soccer, you know, it's, that's why we, that's, that's one of the key components of assessing. There's no like general guidelines on how many calories this you need if you play this sport, it really depends on the weight. So a 300 pound athlete versus 150 pound athlete that's doing the same amount of work, they're going to need completely different calories because you have 150 more pounds of mass. So it really depends on weight, height, age, level of activity. There's so many different var variables that go into that. It's not really based on the sport as much as the level of activity for that athlete. 
Yeah, I agree. And for me, if I just want to make it as simple as possible, what kind of session training session did you have? Did you have an easy session or did you have a hard session? Obviously with the hard session, we want half our plate to be carbohydrates, whether it's an easy session, it's going to be more of a quarter of your plate being carbohydrates and still getting the same amount of protein in there and still making sure that we get our vegetables. Yeah. I get that question. It's like, how many calories if I need, if I play this sport and I'm like, I don't know. I have to really sit down and ask you a bunch of questions to see what it looks like. Um, but I know that's that's a common question I get a lot. And it's tough to really do that without an assessment. So that's I love the way you mentioned that, Joanne. It's just like it all depends on intensity. That's it's actually a question I ask because you might say, all right, well, you're going to practice for two hours. Well, and some some of these kids, they sit around for those two hours. They're not they're not a starter. They're trying to accomplish a goal, but they're not they're not a high minute athlete yet. And baseball practice might be, oh, I, I threw a few bullpen sessions and then I stood around and watched the other 90 minutes. Well, they're not going to burn a lot of calories. Whereas if you think they are, then you might overestimate their calorie needs. Right. So I'm going to pause here. I still don't, I believe we don't have anything in the chat, but I have a question to the audience, um, our participants, feel free to either unmute yourself or go ahead and write in the chat box, it's making sure that you're you're actively engaging with us. What's the single most contributor to poor athlete health and recovery? Again, what is the most, the single most contributor to poor athlete health and recovery? Is it life stress, lack of sleep, underfueling, or overfueling? And feel free to free text you if there's anything else you think is the more most sing, single most contributor. One hundred percent correct for those that have been putting it in the chat. So I'm glad you're listening, not falling asleep on us. Hopefully, we're providing even more information above your knowledge for application. We had a question that was sent in to us uh, regarding this topic. Um, we had someone ask about how do you develop a plan for athletes who choose vegan or plant-based diets? How do they make sure they're getting their protein amount? How do they make sure they're getting the nutrition that they need? Joanne, you want to take it first or you want me to go? Sure. I, I um, Please add to it. But so one of the things that I've noticed in my community and population that I work with is the plant forward style of eating. So it's not completely vegan, vegetarianism, lacto ovo, pescatarian, et cetera, that's out there um, because many people will do a flexitarian diet. So there's so many definitions of what types of vegetarianism that one may be following. So to kind of grasp that whole scope of all the different diets out there, I'm going to say plant forward dieting or plant forward eating. Um, so you're including a lot of vegetarian products and that can absolutely be incorporated into an athlete's plan if that's what they choose to follow. Um, I think there are definitely some challenges with the environment. For example, if you don't have an, a training table to that has um, those types of items that you're looking for. If you don't have the dining facility to support that, or maybe not the, not necessarily all the cooking knowledge of what to buy, what to prepare and how to do it in a vegetarian way, then that is a challenge. And then Tavis, I'll throw it over to you as far as the nutritional needs. Yeah, I think the key now is it's what's compared to when, you know, you and I came in this industry 19, 20 years ago, there's a lot more products available to choose from, right? You know, we see a lot of these, impossible burgers and plant-based or vegetarian-based, you know, meats and things that for the individual that is, that is more vegetarian, vegan, or whatever their choice is, we have a lot more protein-rich foods that are available, whether it's a good quality powder or whether it's a good uh, substitute for, for meat. So I think that's one of the key things is protein has always been the biggest challenge for those type of athletes, but, you know, there are a lot of resources, whether again, it's those plant-based products, powders, nuts, nut butters, um, there's a lot of options that we can do, even if they do, if they do like dairy, that obviously, you know, makes it a little bit easier. If they're completely vegan, it's a little bit more challenging. We have to look at some, some B vitamin deficiencies that could arise in those, those type of athletes and potentially iron deficiencies that could arise and even vitamin D, which that's going to be prevalent in the majority of athletes. And really something we neglect a lot of is omega-3, you know, omega-3 is a big deficiency in the entire world with only about 
I'd say, I don't know the percentage of the population because it hasn't been studied yet, but you know, we see the average omega-3 index at about three and a half to, to 3.7% when it should be 8%. I'll talk a little bit about that later when we get to supplements. So there's a lot of nutrients we have to look into uh, and see. The tough part is getting a true full micronutrient test and evaluation because it's not that it's not that it's not inexpensive. It's expensive to do a micronutrient test. So to get that level and indication, an athlete can be difficult. Yeah, and I think exploring the different types of foods that are now available, you touched on that. It, it, the industry has been tre grown tremendously on the Beyond Meat type foods. And so um, I think exploring the nuts, the seeds, the tofu or soy meat, the legumes, the lentils, beans, those are all part of a good plant forward type of meal plan and style of eating. Absolutely. So I still feel free again to uh, go ahead and unmute or, or chat, put anything in the chat if you'd like um, as we continue forward. So what are some steps for building a nutrition plan for an athlete or team? I think Travis, you touched on most of that already is doing a full blown individual history of the athlete. Um, so it's hard for a lot of us, especially if you're strength and conditioning coach and you have you know, a, t a huge team or several teams to deal with to sit down one on one with them is very difficult for the dietitian. But I also know that there's sports nutritionists out there that can provide some of this type of information. And it is it's really individualized and personalized. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. It's it really just depends on the individual and where you're starting. Everybody's going to be completely different. There's never a one size fits all approach. And and the way I like to look at it is just, it's all habit-based. We try to fix one thing at a time. If you try to do too much, it's going to overwhelm them and it's going to be almost difficult. Even in adults that I work with outside of the athlete world, they try to do too much. They have this mindset of, I have to be perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect nutrition plan. Just be really good and be consistent. And if you are good and consistent, the outcome is going to change. And that's, that's the struggle that most people have is they, you know, they create this mindset of perfection and we have to avoid doing that. Agree. Now I'm curious to know in the audience today, what are some common myths or misconceptions that you hear about from your athletes or that you come across yourself? I love this topic. I'm curious to see what they say. So feel free again to unmute or chat. I'd love to hear what things you're hearing. I don't know about you, Tavis. I hear a lot of so I have social media and these days I tend to avoid it as much as possible and just read a good book instead yeah. uh, because it's filled with a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah, it seems like the, the so-called nutrition experts are those with the most followers, but they have the most dangerous information, um, you know, and it's, it's, that's, that's what's really confusing about a lot of the stuff. We, people are going to constantly be confused because of just the, the lack of regulation in this industry and what we can and can't do and do or what we can do because anybody can pretty much say things. Um, and I love some of the things that are coming in now, like carbs are bad, fasted workouts are best, uh, the efficiency of low carb diets and endurance supplement will solve the under, I mean, those are all incredible. The only thing I could add to that is you need, you need an exorbitant amount of protein, which I see, um, you know, being recommended a lot to people. It's like, wow, your body can't utilize any more than a, than a gram per pound for what you need it to. So if you're 150 pounds and you're consuming 250 grams of protein, you're wasting a hundred grams of protein. So yeah, it's especially for the athlete carbs are bad. It's just, that's just bad advice. Um, so I love, I, I hate and love when I, when I see that because it's, it's ways we can correct that. That's some of the things I tell my athletes is look, look, especially high school kids, I, I categorize them. These are your state championship carbs. These are your district championship carbs. These are your missed the playoff carbs. And obviously the state championships are going to be the sustainable energy carbs, your potatoes, your rice, your fuel, your fruits, even some vegetables, whole grains, your missed the playoff carbs. It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean you can't eat them. It just means they need to be minimal. The donuts, the sugars, the cookies, you know, there's a place for that. It's like, if you want sugar, have it during and after a workout. I'm not saying bring donuts to baseball or football practice. But it's like, if you really want to optimize your you know, intake and you're going to have that stuff, that's fine. Let's not demonize food, but let's also make sure we understand how do we truly fuel that engine the best and then limit the other things in the diet to minimal. 
Yeah, and Tavis. Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, thank, no problem. I just want to add to that, Tavis, as you talk about your high school athletes, maybe even going into the collegiate realm, I think about the military side of the house and, and recovery and nutrition. And sometimes they just don't get that nutrition. So that becomes a huge challenge because sometimes you go out on missions that could be anywhere between you know a few hours to several days without food and with minimal just beverages to, to hydrate. But in your instance, in the military realm, it's a matter of life or death. You know, you 0.02 seconds could mean a matter of, you know, getting a bullet, getting hit by a bullet versus, you know, not getting hit and being able to outrun the enemy where there isn't any endorsements or medals or championships in that case. So they really do have to follow a, a nutrition plan that gets them at their optimal performance, you know, every, every day to be ready for any mission or deployment. So yeah. And that's how I relate that to my, you know, population. Yeah. That's, it's a whole different animal when you're looking at life or death situation and, and how critical nutrition is. And I see one of the questions that came in, it's a great question. Intermittent fasting is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a type of diet, right? And can it work? Sure, it can work. But when we look at athletes, it's a whole different animal in the approach, whether it's tactical athletes, performance-based athletes, you know, on a, in a sport. It, fasting is a way that people typically take just to lose weight. And it's no different than any other approach in the fact that it puts you in a deficit if the calories you choose put you in a deficit. So if you want to eliminate a meal and that means you eat less calories, then at the end of the day, whether it's low carb, whether it's that, and again, weight loss is a different, different approach, but they did a study. They looked at a year of intermittent fasting, 12 months versus a calorie controlled approach and both groups lost the same amount of weight and fat. So the key is if you follow anything, you will get results. If it's not sustainable, if it's, you know, a diet that lasts two months or three months and you go back to old habits, that's not a sustainable approach. So you just have to figure out what works best for you. But for the high performance person, I typically don't recommend fasting as a way to do that when, especially the type of athletes I work with, you need to have brain fuel. You need to be able to focus. You need to be able to think. So that's not usually an approach I, I deal with. I don't know about you, Tavis. Sorry, we have a couple no, okay. questions in the chat I want to make sure that we hit on. Um, someone asked, given how some items like the Impossible Burger or Stevia are as processed as they are, what are your thoughts on incorporating them into a nutrition plan? So we'll start out with the Impossible Burger. You know, that's something I've tried. So whether it's anecdotal or testimonial from, from my side, I'm not endorsing any particular product or brand, but I do want to say that it has its merit for someone who's trying to follow a, you know, a non-meat diet plan. Uh, I, you know, looking at it, there are some brands that have a, a length, a plethora of ingredients on the back of that. And I like to always say the less ingredients, the better, because that means they're putting less into that food item um, and you're getting it in its most pure, rare form as possible. Now, knowing that there's these vegan vegetarian options out there, um, a lot of it is a taste profile. How does it taste to you? Because if I tell someone, if I tell my athlete or client that they should eat these types of foods and they dislike it, then I'm just not going to have any credibility anymore. So you have to meet your athletes and clients in the middle. What are they willing to try? And what are, again, if you go back to the health history, some of these products are very high in sodium or they could be very high in fat. So you just have to leverage that and what their goals are and where you want to go with that and meet them in the middle. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. I mean, I look at these products as no different than anything else. And the fact that I'm not, um, some of these, some of these athletes I work with, they're going to eat processed foods. I'm I, again, I don't like to demonize and say, you can't have this because you're going to, you, if you tell an athlete, you can't do this or that you're done. They're never going to trust you again. And I've, I've seen that early on in my career thinking it has to be this or that, right. And it doesn't have to be this or that. Our, our job is we try to steer them to where we think is best for them based on what we know. But in some cases that might not always be the case and might not work out as reality. So it's, you know, we, we try to follow things we've learned in textbook things, but in, in practical life, textbook doesn't really apply as much as we think it does. So we have to really look at certain things and the thoughts of, I know that question on inflammatory ingredients in impossible eating one meal like that, you know, is not just going to spark inflammation. You know, it has to be a cascade of meals over and over, over a period of time. So, 
you know, if you eat Doritos, will that cause inflammation? Maybe. I mean, it's hard to really say the impact of one little food or meal on your entire, like, say, high sensitivity CRP levels, inflammatory levels in the body. At the end of the week or the month or the year, it's really your balance of everything in your diet. If your omega-3 intake is high, then, you know, an omega-6 isn't bad. But if your omega-3 intake's good and your omega-6 intake's good, then you probably will have less inflammation. If your omega-6 is really high, like it is in our country at 20 to 1, then you'll probably have more inflammation if you're not balancing those foods with other good nutrients. Right. And plant foods are really high in polyphenols as well. And that is your, many of your higher antioxidants. And in regards to the stevia part of that question is if you like it and you're not consuming it in excess, then there's nothing wrong with it. Just like Truvia or other brands out there, your, your, uh, your other sweeteners, artificial sweeteners. I've tried a variety of them. Again, unless you're taking in mass quantities of it every day, I really don't think that's an issue. Again, it's a taste preference, especially if you're trying to lower your calories on regular sugar. We had another question that was, how do the, how do you guys define carbs for athletes? And then can you address the increasing the widespread issues with gluten, grains, and things like, uh, like GMO corn? That's a big question there. So I'll start with the definition of carbohydrates. It's your macronutrient where you get from whether it's whole grain, whole wheat foods to the simple sugars, right? You've got your complex carbohydrates and you have your simple sugars, which is your, you know, your lactose, your fructose, your cakes, cookies, pies, and other things that we get immediate sugar. It goes into our bloodstream. It provides energy immediately. So um, there is the good and the bad, so to speak there. Um, and so athletes, depending on when their training session is or their competition or event and how hard their sessions are and how long their sessions are, will always define how to periodize their nutrition. In this case, how to time their nutrition appropriately, particularly when it comes to carbs. I don't want to go do a 60 minute workout that involves a lot of endurance, cardio, and, and maybe even some power strength lifting type of um, exercises if I don't have any carbs in my fuel tank, for example. Yeah, I don't look at gluten, grains, things like that as widespread issues. Actually, the GMO and non-GMO, there's very little science to support that one is better than the other. Um, but that's a whole different topic. But from the gluten and grain stuff, again, that's if someone has an issue. That's a very, probably, that's a very small percentage of our population that actually has celiac it's a small percentage of our population that has an intolerance. If someone does and they have a, you know, a test that determines that, then, then we eliminate those foods from their diet. But that doesn't mean gluten-free foods are any, any better. It just means it's good for that individual that may not have the ability to tolerate that, whether it's lactose, gluten, whatever. You know, they have to get tested, determine you know, if they have a biopsy of their stomach. And it's like, hey, you have celiac or you have, you have a true quality food sensitivity test and you are sensitive to gluten or whatever food then yeah, we eliminate that. And, uh, but overall, I don't, I don't look at that as a widespread issue. It's a pretty small issue overall. We had another question that was, uh, reads, you spoke to the challenge of motivating high school athletes to feel more appropriately. How do you motivate change where there is perhaps a different mindset among friends, family, or at home? Tavis, you work with your high school athletes. Yeah, I'll let school. you. I was scrolling up. I was listening to Naomi and I was trying, trying to, and I was like, wait, I didn't see it. Now I'm scrolling up to look at it. So you spoke to the challenge of, yeah, motivating to few more. Um, how do you motivate change where there's perhaps a different mindset? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I get that a lot because parents call and they're like, Hey, my son or daughter, well, they, they really need this. And I'm like, well, how motivated are they? Do they want this? Are they ready for this? Are they open to, because I mean, I have a 10 year old daughter and <laughs> We had a discussion this morning about she didn't have breakfast coming from her mom's and I brought her to school and it's like, oh, well, I want a muffin. I'm like, well, we talk about certain things and it's like no different than the athlete talking to their parents like they don't want to hear it from mom or dad. No matter what you know, they don't want to hear you give them advice. They want hugs and kisses. So to motivate them, a couple of things that that work. Number one, they have to see it from others that they work with. And one of the things that I, we tell teams and, and high school teams we work with, give us your most motivated athletes. Who are the ones that show up on time, that do the work, that are, that are motivated, that want to change the way they feel? 
And those are the ones that are going to have success. When you build success stories already in your environment and culture, then you change culture. So you take those athletes that are motivated. You don't go take 10 unmotivated athletes that have no desire to be there because you're not going to change behavior. So that's one thing. On the family side, if mom and dad are not involved in the child's lifestyle, then chances that child's not going to have a lot of success. That's what we've seen. You have to have, number one, motivated athletes, but you also have to have parental support to where you have parents that are truly involved in the success of that athlete that helps them with meal prep, that helps them with bringing food to school, that helps them with understanding, hey, you might have to get up 10 minutes earlier uh, and put some value around this. And if they don't, then they don't, and they're not going to see the outcome. But when they see others doing it, hey, that kid's bringing seven sandwiches to school. Wow, I didn't realize I had to do that to fuel my body properly because some of these high school athletes are on campus for 14 hours and they're living off a of lunch. They're not going to get the results. So uh, usually they have to see others have success. Or, you know, in my case, what I try to do is say, look, here are some people I've worked with that have helped get to that level. I hate doing that because to me, it doesn't matter who you, who you work with, but they're like, oh, you work with this person, that person. That helps kind of get them understanding like, wow, these athletes have invested in their nutrition and that builds credibility. We had another question that was a lot of recreational athletes use their given sport for weight management. What recommendations would you give for them losing weight while still managing to fuel properly for their sport? Are there better times to focus on loss than others, like preseason or in season or off season? That's a great question. And I'll go ahead and start, Tavis, if you don't mind, um, because the recreational athletes and the different sports that are out there. There's the ones that are weight controlled. When you think about your UFC MMA fighter having to be weight classified, your boxer, um, even figure skaters, gymnasts, as we've saw in the, uh, the most recent Olympics, they have to maintain a certain physique and a certain weight. And there's a lot of pressure for that as we, we probably already have seen in our experience. So my recommendations for someone trying to lose weight is absolutely do it during the off season weight control is not something you want to manage while you're in season for sure. So, um, and for example, bodybuilders, I get a lot of my students that ask about bodybuilders and them having to really just draw down on their weight during peak week or, or during that last week before they get up on stage. And I, I almost think about our military tactical side as well. They try to drop weight right before their physical fitness testing that's done annually or biannually. And they do methods like the sauna dehydration type methods. They will wear these sweatsuits and these really poor methods of proper weight loss. And so when you look at that, that will put you in, in whether it's injury or uh, a medical concern. So the better time to focus is definitely during off season and that it's no more than one to two pounds per week because anything beyond that is just usually water weight. And so fueling for properly for their sport means again, seeing that sports nutritionist or that sports dietitian to manage their individualized and their personalized nutrition so that it's periodized depending on what, how their training is during their periodization of their, of their workouts, or whether it be when their preseason is off season and in season. I know football is just around the corner. We're all excited for it. So we don't have our defensive linemen dropping weight right now. We have them working on fine tuning their body fat goals and their carbohydrates and making sure they receive enough protein post-workouts. Yeah, the only thing I, I'll add is, is in working with wrestlers and working with boxers is the fact that you mentioned it spot on. You have to start this way in advance. I see a time in high school athletes, six the wrestlers, they're like, oh, my coach wants me to drop 20 pounds. You know, it's like they're getting ready in the fall to get ready for the season. And all of a sudden they want to lose 20 pounds in a month and they're starving themselves. They're nibbling on crackers. That's the worst thing these kids can do. Now there's regulation on what the National Wrestling Coaches Association allows in regards to how much weight someone can lose in a week, which is great. It's just not managed very well. So, I mean, the best thing to do is, again, start in time. That way, when you get, get to the season, you only have a few pounds to lose, and you're not trying to go into a massive calorie deficit, which is going to impact your performance on the matter in the ring. 
All right, with time in mind, I would like to move us to the next topic if that's okay. Uh, but does anyone have any other, do you have any final notes of things that you wanted to touch on with this topic specifically? Or does anyone have any last questions with this? We have other topics to cover, so your question will be answered. <laughs> Great, I'll move us to the next one, nutrition for recovery. So this is a really good topic. I mean, your recovery is so many different things from obviously repairing glycogen and you know repairing carbohydrates to help your body recover protein recovery and muscle repair, uh, as well as inflammation. So recovery has so many different parts of the puzzle. And I like this first question, can nutrient deficiencies increase injury risk? I think we talked a little bit about that earlier with vitamin D. We've seen some studies there in regards to low vitamin D levels, increased risk of fractures. That's probably the one nutrient I've seen more science associated when it comes to the injury side. Um, Joanne, have you seen anything else outside of the vitamin D spectrum? Um, for my population that I work with, iron is definitely a concern because um, that impairs performance, whether it's the females during their menstrual cycle phases where they're losing a lot of iron or maybe it's just an, you know, a lot of running. So they may, it may be diluted in, their, in that fact with iron loss potentially, and uh, just poor eating strategies in general. So I iron, vitamin D, and sometimes calcium can be an issue. But, but yeah, I think vitamin D is huge and iron and calcium. And I, like you mentioned and emphasize omega-3s. Yeah. Yeah. I know when we get to supplements, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about omega-3 fish oil, things like that. But that is, that's my, one of my go-tos for every single athlete I work with, no matter if they're 10, 12, 14, all the way up to whatever age they are. I think everybody should be taking a good omega-3 supplement. Yeah, so are there specific foods to help with the healing process? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I mean, that's a big answer because I don't like to say like this food is the best and that food's the best. But yes, there are foods that have, as you know, anti-inflammatories. You mentioned earlier polyphenols. One of the things that I think in the sports world that gets them a lot of attention right now is cherries, right? Tart cherries, cherry juice, tart cherry juice for the anti-inflammatory. If you go into any major locker room collegiate professional, there's probably going to be some cherry juice there because we have good science to show it reduces muscle damage and inflammation after a hard workout. But really all fruits, all vegetables are going to have some anti-inflammatory properties. Lean protein is going to be important and very important for tissue recovery. Um, things like zinc, you know, in, in those type of nutrients and minerals are very important um, when it comes to that for the healing, but also immune system as well. Yeah, and I'll add a few more items to that, like the fruit-derived polyphenols, that's going to be your cherries, particularly the Montmorency cherry type, uh, pomegranate polyphenols, blackberries, blueberries, blackcurrant, and even cocoa help lower the plasma markers of oxidative damage and inflammation. And so, you know, when you look at optimal dosage to support recovery from, say, muscle damage, um, we don't really currently know the exact or have a consensus on that, but I know about 1200 milligrams a day of the Montmorency cherry or uh, like a pomegranate polyphenol for three or more days prior to exercise appears to consistently enhance that muscle recovery. And that kind of leads to that next question. Some days I'm, I'm too fatigued too, and not fully recovered from the week's trainings and workouts. What nutritional recommendations will help me recover faster? And that's that's a really good question. A couple of things we have to look at. Number one is, are you eating enough throughout the week? Are you getting adequate calories? Is it truly a recovery issue, or you know, is it truly just not getting enough nutrition? That you know, because if this is a consistent feeling each week, then we got to look at: Are you training too much? How much are you training? Are you getting enough rest? But from a nutritional side, after a workout, it's carbs and protein. I mean, there's really no you know, other way. I know there used to be a lot of, you know, evidence in the past. You have to consume this stuff right after your workout, right? And that's not necessarily true anymore. For my weight gain athletes, I want them to get calories in as soon as possible because I want to make sure they have as many eating windows as possible throughout the day. For the, the average athlete that is trying to maintain or the athlete trying to maintain or just lose weight, then that timing is not necessarily as critical. What's as critical is just getting enough protein and carbs in the day. But to recover faster, Carbs and protein, typically faster acting carbs will get to the muscle fat. That's why things like chocolate milk has been pretty well studied and effective 
but it doesn't have to be that. It could be a smoothie. It could be a peanut butter sandwich, a peanut butter and honey sandwich. And, you know, and I know sometimes people say, don't, don't consume a lot of fat. Most importantly is what's, what is that athlete going to eat? Sometimes I have athletes that don't even want anything to eat for a couple of hours after a workout because they're just exhausted. So we really have to go in what works for that person more than there's no like best food for recovery, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I have, uh, I love mantras. So I have my four R's restore with fluid electrolytes because it helps lower your core temperature. It helps replenish the sweat that's lost. The second one's replace fuel. As you mentioned, have is carbs and proteins, typically a four to one ratio of your endurance or a two to one ratio in strength from your carbs to protein. My third R is repair. So focusing on that protein pacing, 20 to 40 grams at each meal of protein, it really helps with uh, giving the body's nutrition to aid in that cellular repair and rebuilding like an antioxidant rich diet would do. And then the last R that I have is the rest. It's your remodeling period. So restore, replace, repair, and rest. So Tavis, how much water should an athlete drink? Well, at least a minimum of half their body weight plus fluid losses. So, you know, you take, take the body weight of an individual and just cut it in half an ounce. So if it's 200 pounds, at least a minimum of 100 ounces a day. But then you have to look at what are they going to lose? Where I'm based in New Orleans, the humidity is awful right now. It's 96 with 100% humidity. You walk outside for five minutes, you need to take another shower. So obviously when we look at testing athletes, and that's why, especially football right now, we're weighing athletes before and after practices. We want to see how much weight they lose during their practice. And if it's every pound they lose, we're trying to get at least 16 to 24 ounces of fluid back, minimum of 16. Um, and that way, you know, I've seen athletes lose eight pounds in a practice. Obviously that's a, that's a bigger lineman. So we're not, we're not trying to get a hundred ounces right back real quick. That's not going to be that easy for that athlete, but at least a minimum of half plus half their body weight, plus what they lose in fluid ounces through training. Yeah. And I think, Water is, is the best method if you are trying to just hydrate and your activity is less than 60 minutes. Um, but if you are in those hot, humid, or maybe extreme austere conditions and your workouts or trainings or competitions are longer, especially for these endurance competitions, then that's where the sports drinks and the sport beverages really need to come into play and practicing that before the actual competition or event. So you're talking about, you know, a four to 8% carbohydrate beverage uh, content. And so it provides a lot of the fast acting simple sugars um, to, to restore that energy in the system. And then if carbohydrates aren't ingested immediately before exercise, then you absolutely need to think about not just carbohydrate beverages or uh, recovery drinks, but think about your sports gels, goos, and, and, you know, high carb type items, you know, every hour for as long as the event. Cause I get, I get some guys that are doing ruck marches for three to four hours at a time. So they definitely need to be getting carbs in after that first hour. And then every three hours, they should be getting about 20 to 25 grams of protein to maintain that muscle mass. Um, Cause breakdown, especially when they're carrying load 50, 60 pounds on their backpack, then they're really breaking down muscle at that tent, at that point. So we need to make sure that they take in a little bit of protein during those workouts as well. And then absolutely at the end of a workout, if you can't get to food immediately, then a carbohydrate protein beverage, again, that ratio of a three to one or four to one um, is going to be perfect. And if not, then a sports beverage until you can get to your next meal would be appropriate. Do you have any questions related to nutrition for recovery? I actually had a question. Um, so I'm a rugby player who play 80 minute matches and then always consistently at the end of our games, I tend to feel nauseous if I don't like drink enough water during the game or if I don't have a snack during the game. What's going to be the ideal snack for either when I'm coming right off the pitch or if I'm trying to get a snack right at the half? My first question is what time is the match? And then what time is your pregame meal? Usually varies, but usually it's in the morning, like 11 o'clock or so. And so 11 o'clock would be the match. Mm -hmm. And then what time would, what time would you eat prior to that match? 
probably eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Okay. Yeah. So a good, a good breakfast pr prior to that match is important. And then somewhere around halftime might be good to where you get some adequate carbohydrate. You don't want anything that's going to sit in the gut for too long. Obviously you don't want a lot of protein during the match. You don't want a lot of fat during the match. And it could be, I mean, we've used a lot of different things in the, in this space, whether it's bananas, whether it's a rice crispy treat, whether it's a, a nutrition bar, there's no like ideal. It really it depends on your gut and what it tolerates. I've had athletes do things, during a match or during a game. And I'm like, that works. I'm like, you don't feel sick. And they're like, no, I feel fine. And it could have been like an encrustable peanut butter and jelly that was out for them. But <laughs> others, we did gels and chews. It just, it really just depends. We want a quick carbohydrate source that can get absorbed and digested pretty quickly without causing GI distress. And again, everybody's different in how their body tolerates that. In some cases I've used slower acting carbs and that works well. And for others, it didn't work as well. And I think to answer your question, to help answer your question there is we've seen some of our uh, professional football players, you know, with their Skittles in hand, right? Um, and so everyone has their preference. And it, it just as Tavis said, it's what do you tolerate? What makes you feel better after having that? And I, I, I actually have a question now for the participants. So what do you think a good recovery combination of carbs and proteins would be? So again, if you're trying to recover from a workout, what do you think would be appropriate? Would you say a banana and an energy drink? Would you say maybe a lean meat pizza and some water, fruit and yogurt, or a slice of bread with some jam? So feel free to, to type in which items or food combinations would be appropriate as a recovery food or foods for carbohydrates and proteins. Again, banana and energy drink, lean meat pizza and water, fruit and yogurt, or a slice of bread and jam getting me hungry over here. It is lunch. It is about lunchtime for us, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and some have added their own food items, which is perfect. I like the rice, liquid egg whites, pizza and water. Yeah, surprisingly, a lean meat pizza and water is a great carbohydrate and protein combination that it's appropriate, especially when you think about our younger athletes. They're not necessarily going to be looking for maybe a yogurt and granola afterwards. They want something enjoyable. Yeah, sodium, carbs, fluid, and fruit and yogurt would be an absolute, you know, easy, quick, easy recovery combination as well. Yeah, performance bars. They've they've developed so many out there. It's it's at least a billion dollar, you know, um, investment into all these different types of nutrition bars, performance bars out there. And a lot of it, I base it first and foremost off the taste, and then I look: does it meet my carbohydrate and protein goals based on the type of activities that I'm doing for that particular that particular day? We had a great question of how would you go about working with an athlete who is hesitant to change their nutrition for appropriate macronutrient composition and prefers to use beverages slash supplements like fit aid? Well, I'm going to say an answer that probably would not sound nice, but you got to let them fail because if they don't, if they don't trust you and they're not going to follow your advice, then it usually takes them struggling to really buy into it sometimes. And, you know, and that's what I've just dealt with. Like I've, I've had athletes like, look, if you can just do this, you're going to see a difference. And they just get so stuck in their own habits. And it usually takes them realizing like, look, this isn't working anymore. I need to try something new. Um, but supplements never solve the problem, you know, and I know we're going to get to that topic. I think next, uh, nothing will acutely change performance. That's legal. I can, uh, besides good food and, and, and timing food and adequate calories. So, uh, in some cases, if they're not going to, if they're not going to listen to a professional, then it's almost like don't invest in that athlete. It's almost, they're not motivated. And in, in my world of sports nutrition, I say that, you know, grab the low hanging fruit for no pun intended. Right. Um, but what can you easily make that is a very small minuscule change for that athlete in regards to their nutrition? Maybe they just need to drink a little more water, maybe one more extra bottle of water that day. 
you know, or maybe they do like fruits. And so maybe we need to up that to one a day, or maybe for that week you have that they meet their three fruits a day or their five vegetables a day and work on that slowly. So again, it's just making sure you grab the, the quickest and the easiest goals first, and then you can work on the more complex scenarios. And Mark, I look forward to hearing more about your performance bar when it's all said and done. Yeah, that's, that's going to be good. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, and Joanne, you mentioned a great point. And one thing I didn't mention is just, I would want to know why they're hesitant. You know, I, I, I think my answer probably came off as a little blunt, but I, I read it as they don't want to change. But if they're hesitant to change, then figure out why. Like, what is it? What's, what are they scared to do? Why are they not investing in food first? All right, I'm going to move us to the next topic so we can try to stay on time here. Nutrition for body recomposition. So athletes timing meals and nutrients, that goes into usually reaching out to a professional and getting their meals periodized and personalized based on their sport and on their status as an athlete if they're like running for a university they're you know or they're trying to get on a pro team or whether it's a military you know soldier sailor or air force men that are trying to go to a specific school well you have to look to see what's realistic and what can they do based on the guidelines from a uh, um, a professional so whether it's that sports nutritionist or that sports dietitian. Yeah, and, and, and as Joanne mentioned, just for, for the recomposition, this needs to start in the off season. You don't, you don't try to recomp or do anything with body comp during the season. You really need to make sure they're adequately fueled because in most cases, athletes lose weight during the season. It's not uncommon for them to not get enough nutrition. So really just need to look at their, their off season training, what they're doing. Their schedule is such a critical thing and their schedule is going to change. I, I have athletes now that now high school has started. We got to change when they eat. Um, you know, in the, they, they were training in the morning. Now they're training in the evening and there's things that we have to move calories around. So, uh, it really just depends on that athlete's schedule in regards to timing, caloric value. You know, I don't, I don't have them track macros. I don't think that's a very safe thing to do at, at, at a young level, uh, really at any level, but at the same time, it's more about habits. It kind of goes to the next question. I know we, I think we kind of addressed the next one on fasting that was in the chat earlier too, as well as in regards to losing weight. I don't, I don't typically advise this at all for athletes. And I think all of us pretty much fast. I sleep for about eight hours every night and I'm not eating during those, those sleeping hours. So in my opinion, I'm, I'm fasting in that sense. <laughs> yeah. I have to so Oh yeah. I wake up fairly hungry. So what, what athletes looking to gain weight and build muscle, what are some common reasons they don't get the results? Yeah, this, this is 70% of my population of athletes I work with. And number one is inadequate fueling, but it's, they're doing too much activity is number one is they they're doing in some of these cases, I see athletes doing four to six hours a day of movement. The youth athlete they think they need to do more in order to get bigger and stronger. And it's actually, it's, it's actually negating their ability because I try to tell them, you know, especially let's say summer activities, try to keep your, your activity outside of what you're already doing with school sports, strength and conditioning off season, or they might be going to a private trainer to a minimum, meaning don't go play three hours of basketball. If you're trying to gain weight, don't go get, don't do an extra lifting session. Uh, number two is they typically sleep too late on the weekends. So they're missing out on calories because their first meal is until 12, one o'clock in the day. And that's, that's a problem when you're used to eating at six o'clock. Um, during school, it's they don't bring food to school. So they have to have a plan. And if they're skipping meals, if they're skipping breakfast, they're probably not going to meet their calorie goals. If they're not bringing food to school, then they're going to be on campus for 12 hours. It's going to be impossible for, to meet their calorie goals because the school food nutrition program, they don't provide enough calories for lunch. So, you know, those are just common things that I see is just sleeping too late, doing way too much activity, not putting any interest or investment in their nutrition, but they're, you know, they're not eating in between meals. They're going long periods of time and that's, that's causing them to underfuel. And that leads us into the last question is some of the strategies that I recommend is staying on top of your hydration game. 
Sometimes those sport beverages will also have a good amount of calories if that's necessary. Plan your nutrition according to your training with the, using the FIT principle. Build it into your routine. I think that's the biggest thing. Make it a habit. It takes three weeks to do anything to make a habit. So, you know, every day for three weeks, we try to get that athlete to make it a habit to eat. And then a recovery pantry is was one of those rituals that I have is let's think about your environment, your car, a locker, backpack, break room, gas station snacks. Where are your windows of opportunity so that you can at least get that good foundational nutrition set? Absolutely. We had one question that was sent into us earlier that was, um, what is some of the, what is the best method for losing fat? Whether that was like complex carbohydrates or protein, like which was more important to, to eat to, to help lose fat? Calorie deficit. <laughs> so three things we have to do to lose fat and, and, and build muscle. You have to be in a progressive calorie deficit, meaning not, not drastic. You have to start four or 500 calorie deficit and build from there. I see too many people doing these starvation diets, thousand calories, 1100 calories, and you have to have room to progressively move lower, right? You're going to, you can lose weight quick like that, but you're going to gain it all back because you're going to impair your metabolic system. You're going to lower your resting metabolic rate, and you can't maintain a thousand calories for a very long period of time. So you have to be in a progressive calorie deficit, start a little bit below what your output is, and then eventually you're going to hit a plateau and drop. But you also have to have adequate protein so you don't lose muscle tissue. That's a really important thing. For me, it's I focus on about 70 to 80% of the body weight of the athlete, so 0.7 to 0.8, especially if they're doing three to five days a week of lifting. But then they should be lifting weights. So if you're lifting weights, adequate protein and a moderate calorie deficit, that's the best way to lose fat, in my opinion, based on what I've seen. Concur. All right, does anyone have any questions before we move on to the supplements topic? All right, let's move on. Supplements. All right, 60% of college athletes use supplements as, as do many young athletes. What's, what's the biggest concern? Wow. This could take me an hour, but I'm not going to not going to take that long. I'm going to give you the, the cliff notes. The biggest concern is the adulteration. That's this is a it's a it's a regulated industry. Yes, the FDA does regulate dietary supplements, but it's very loosely. Um, there's so many products on the market. There's so many false claims uh, and there's a lot of hype around so many things. There's no dietary supplement that will acutely change performance. And there are things that have evidence that will work. But. The biggest industry in some of the spaces I've worked with, I've, I've formulated vitamins. I've, I've, I've launched a company for a large hospital system from the ground up. So the most important thing I see for the athlete is they have to use third-party certified brands, NSF for sport, informed choice, informed sport. If it's not third-party tested, you're playing Russian roulette because I see it all the time. I see athletes testing positive for banned substances and pre-workouts. Uh, we've seen pre-workouts that have tested positive for cocaine, metformin, which is a diabetes drug, amphetamine compounds. Um, if they're not using third-party tested products, then the risk for testing positive is going to be a problem. So the biggest concern is the adulteration in the industry, as well as um, a lot of just bad companies that don't make good products. But uh, And also the MLMs, that doesn't help our industry when you have people that know nothing about nutrition selling and pushing supplements to people that don't know anything about nutrition. Yeah, I, I will have to echo that profusely to athletes is you never know what substances are really truly in those those different types that are out there from your fat burners to your muscle enhancers. And that could be, that could be, a, that could be career ending. So that is a big concern there. So echoing what you've said. So Tavis, are there recommended supplements that are supported by science? Yeah, and it really depends on the purpose. So let's, let's take strength. I'll, I'll go in categories, I guess. Strength, you know, it's going to be protein, which is, yeah, it can be a supplement, but adequate protein can obviously improve strength. Creatine, which there's so much misconception about creatine. And I, we can have a whole webinar just on creatine, but creatine is right now 
65,000 studies on creatine. The majority of those don't even look at athletic performance. They look at clinical populations. They look at medical conditions like muscular dystrophy, cancer, concussion. Um, but creatine is very effective. But it has to be in use with adequate calories. You just don't take creatine and you know not eat enough, and you you see gains in muscle. So when it comes to the strength and performance side, those are vitamin D can be helpful as well, as well as omega three has some anabolic properties, but there's still needs to be more study there. So when it comes to strength, protein and creatine, as well as adequate calories are going to be, you know, effective ways to see strength uh, in, in building muscle improve. On the anti-inflammatory side, there's a couple of things that I'm very fond of. Obviously, omega-3 has good science. It reduces inflammation. Curcumin turmeric extract uh, is also very effective at reducing muscle damage, as well as tart cherry juice, as you mentioned earlier. Those are, they, have, they all have good clinical and, and scientific evidence to support using them as post-workout. And curcumin and omega-3, they're so versatile. They have, they have a lot of the same properties, not just concussion and, and brain health, but heart health and anti-inflammatory. They're almost like the same nutrient. I mean, I, I personally take those two every single day. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence out there for supplements for bone, bone and joint health. So that, again, that calcium and vitamin D, which we can always get in our foods if we eat the proper food if we are fueling our body with the proper foods, supplements that might work, creatine, caffeine is one that we exploit almost every day. I know I do. And so that what, staying within that one to three milligrams per kilogram of body weight for performance is, can be really helpful. Um, so, and then there's some moderate doses, but we just don't want in excess because we know the studies out there show that there is, um, there is harmful um, potential negative effects. And then bicarbonate is another one that I've seen, but when it comes to, for college athletes, which supplements are allowed and which ones aren't, we absolutely recommend going to the NCAA's banned substances list. And that's constantly being updated. So that always should be the go-to before recommending any supplements. Yeah, and I mean, and the, to answer that last question, you avoid it by just taking third-party testing. Uh, if you if you use an NSF or Informed Choice or Informed Sport third-party tested brand, then you know they're clean. There's always a, a slight risk. We never want to say 100%, but we know they go through what's called the ISO. Um, uh, what is it? ISO, I think, 102 something, whatever. It's a lab, basically, that test for 270 to 300 banned substances. Uh, it's the gold standard in third-party testing and NSF and, and Informed Choice both use those, those type of labs to test their products. So, or they, they have a lab where companies pay those two third-party testing companies to assess their products. If it doesn't have that logo on the product, then your athlete's running the risk. And it doesn't matter if they've used it before. I hear that, oh, I've used this before. I've never tested positive. Well, that lot can get spiked if they're using a manufacturing facility that allows banned substances. And let's, 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 get, I'll give you a quick example. What's a banned substance? Well, it's anything on the banned substance list. It could be steroids. It could be amphetamine compounds. It could be things like, um, if we look at, um, marijuana or, or street drugs, but also it could be stimulants like synephrine or bitter orange, which is in a lot of different pre-workouts or even some energy drinks like the, the energy drink Celsius contains the banned substance guarana, which is banned by the NCAA. Um, so you have to be really cautious. And if some of these manufacturing facilities are using a banned substance, it doesn't mean it's always illegal, like dimethyl amylamine or DMAA is illegal. If anyone's using it, they can go to jail. Synephrine's banned, but it's not illegal. So some manufacturing facilities have it in their facility. And if I was to run, I saw Mark said he's going to make some bars. Let's say you want to make protein and you, you go to a facility that uses synephrine. And the company before that you ran your protein powder from put synephrine in their pre-workout and you run your powder through the same machines and they didn't clean it, synephrine can get into your powder and can contaminate it. We see cross-contamination a lot. So third-party certification and third-party tested supplements are the only way to avoid that risk. Yeah, and I think Mark made a, a great point here in the chat in being completely blunt about it is that we can buy them from anyone, any seller out there who could be an overnight, you know, you know, company or a fly-by-night company. And I can't tell you how much the Department of Justice have really infiltrated the supplement world by going in and getting information and finding that a lot of these supplement companies are a hoax or they're run by 
licensed pharmacists that actually lost their licenses. So we have to be very careful. And then commissions on products. You know, I'm not going to say anything bad about any of these nutritional stores out there, but sometimes there is that commission and those sales that they want to meet. Um, so it's being really informed as a consumer, both for our, for us and for our athletes. Yeah, you made a, and Mark makes a great point is, you know, I tell everyone, do not allow your athletes or tell them you can't trust supplement sales in the supplement stores. They did a study, Journal of Pediatrics did that. A, the, the author of the study pretended to be a 15-year-old athlete who wanted to gain weight, and build muscle, called 244 supplement stores. 42% were trying to sell him a testosterone booster over the phone. So the people that work in the stores, as Mark mentioned, they really have no understanding of third-party certification and third-party testing. So you have to be extremely cautious. Any other any questions? Other? Pass it over to you, Naomi. We had a we had a question sent in that was, uh, what are some side effects of common supplements? Oh, that can be a plethora just from, you know, heart palpitations, maybe blood pressure rises, dehydration are some of the minor ones, but you can go from the spectrum of just not feeling great, maybe a little nauseous feeling, little headache, migraine, all the way to the spectrum of being a heat cat, meaning that you have a heat illness or you end up hospitalized, which could fatally, what, I, what I've seen through some of our military facilities, a lot of our members can, will get into the idea of stacking supplements. So they're taking one supplement over another supplement on top of another supplement or pre-workout in a very um, intense environment, meaning that it's high humidity, high heat, they're in the desert somewhere. And then they end up hospitalized with kidney failure. And some even have, I've seen as far as more, you know, immortality, uh, mortality, your deaths. Yeah. Yeah. The three most common supplements that I've, I've talked to when I've talked to NSF and informed choice, they get adulterated are going to be pre-workouts, testosterone boosters, and diet pills. Um, we see that we, there's a company still roaming around that has uh, a diet supplement with ephedra, which is banned, but it also has eight stimulants and four of those stimulants are illegal. Um, so the FDA just has it. They've caught them and they've sanctioned them numerous times. They pay their fine and they're back selling again. It's kind of unfortunate. We had another question sent that were, uh, is it best to supplement for a long period of time or supplement in short periods of time? I mean, that really depends on what, I mean, there's, there's not really, that's not really like a, a, a I guess, a, an one answer for the whole supplement. I, I take omega three every day. Uh, there's certain things. I take a multivitamin just about every day. I take curcumin turmeric every day. So there's certain things I take daily and some things I, I don't take every single day. It just sometimes it just depends on time and, and memory. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, it really just depends on the product. Agree. Multivitamin, I take, I would recommend daily. Uh, and unless the diet is completely always on point, but I know in our realistically, it's not always like that. And secondly, you know, things like creatine monohydrate is something that I've seen um, athletes successfully cycle. So they'll do it for about 60 days, get off of that. And same thing with caffeine. Some people get more are caffeine sensitive and some people just, if they cycle off and on and back, it provides a uh, uh, you get more success out of that, so to speak. Um, and the efficacy is better when they've taken, they've come off of it for a while. So it all depends on the supplement and the goals and yeah, all of that. Another question, how does someone find a good multivitamin? You know, I'll tell you what my favorite brand is and what I think the gold standard is if I can. So I, th I think Thorne Research is by far the gold standard when it comes to ingredient sourcing, formulation, a lot of their products, not all, because they don't, they have prenatal. So that's not going to be marketed to certain groups. And they have other products that make no sense for athletes. But I think they do a phenomenal job with just the right formulas, using the right minerals for optimal absorption. They use what's called TRACS, T-R-A-C-S, that has, they've, they've been known as the gold standard in, in providing high quality, bioavailable rich minerals. Um, so that's, that's what I use for most of my, most of my personal supplementation use besides maybe omega-3. I'm a big fan of things like Nordic naturals because they have a triglyceride based fish oil 
which is best for absorption and to raise omega-3 index levels. And honestly, I can be frugal. I look to see what's on sale, but at the same time, I look at the back of that supplement panel or nutrition panel, and I want to see 100% daily vitamin daily vitamins being met. Anything in excess of that, especially if you see like 30,000% of vitamin C or some crazy numbers, or even just you know, it only meets 5% of my iron. Then I'm thinking, well, then that's not really giving me what I need. So I have to, I look for what's 100% of the daily value because even some of your generic brands are superior to your branded names and it saves, it, there's a cost savings there. It's all about understanding and reading those nutrition, uh, the labels, whether they're supplement or nutrition. Awesome. Does anyone have any final questions, whether it's on supplements or whether we... Do you have another question about uh, one of our past topics? Feel free to speak up directly or pop it in the chat. Oh, someone asked if you could say the supplement brand again, Travis, that you were talking Born, about. Uh, T-H-O-R-N-E. And if they want to email me, I can put my email here as well. If that's okay. That'd be great. Okay. <sighs> All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, thank you to everybody. Oh, there's a question here. Has there been any research on how supplementation should be adjusted for a pregnant athlete? That's a really good question because the pregnant athlete population is very much understudied. Um, just in general, female athletes are usually not as well studied as are the male counterparts. So supplementation for a pregnant athlete is going to be, again, very individualized. That is going to be based on the healthcare professionals recommendations. There's lab work, as we all know, that's a very special population that requires very personalized individual care. So I'm sure there may be a little bit of research. I haven't dug into that literature review, but um, unless Tavis, you have, I don't know of much research at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that at all. Any other questions? Any final questions? This slide's going to be sent out. Yes, we will make sure that everybody has a recording of this so you will get to see it. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, well, fantastic. Thank you for everybody. Thank you so much, Chavs and Joanne. You have been amazing. Um, I got one more yeah. question. Oh, yep, go ahead. Um, is there a site or something that like, I can't find a sports nutritionist in my area, which is fine. I'm sure I can find one online, but like, how do I, how do I find one that's like good? <laughs> like <laughs> with fitness, you know, like I, I'm ACSM certified. So I like, in like ACSM would be the standard, blah, blah, blah. Is there like a, like a more, you know, and my certification, you have to have a degree to get it, blah, 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 rather than I know that nutrition is the same way they could go online and pay $25 and get a certificate and say that they're a sports nutritionist but yeah. I, I want somebody who's like you know actually educated is there a site that you can find those or like what what's your advice yeah well I mean they, they really can't call themselves a nutritionist with a certification they have especially like in Louisiana if you, if, you, if you call yourself a dietitian and nutritionist without a license you can go to jail um, but there's a lot of people doing that um, yeah, there's, there are websites, um, you know, Joanne and I probably, we both work with people virtually. So we're happy to help you in that, in that case, if needed, um, CPSDA, which is, uh, they, uh, sports RD, that's, that's mostly individuals working with, with teams. They have scan, uh, scan dpg.org. I don't know if that, I think they might have a find a sports nutritionist. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not a member of really these organizations that much anymore. Joanne might have more information. Yeah, if um, you go to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is www.eatright.org, they'll have a place where you can search for a licensed or registered dietitian. And then one thing that I just want to be clear is that if you see the letters CSSD, 
behind that RD's name, that registered dietitian's name, then they are certified in the sport nutrition realm. They've got received a lot of education and, um, you know, have been mentored very comprehensively. And so that CSSD behind the RD status uh, really validates that you've got a good dietitian to assist with you and that's their expertise. Sweet. Can you type that in the chat? I'm driving and doing too many freaking things at the same time. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and Mark, I know Mark asked about ISSN cert. It really just depends on your state and where you're based out of. Some states allow you to, you know, to provide nutrition education and some don't. So you just have to, you know, the, uh, the academy has... Uh, a map of the US and what you're allowed to do based on your level. So like some states, you can't give out any nutrition advice unless you are a dietitian. In other states like California, you probably have freedom to do whatever. And it's, it's a little scary because, you know, you, you, there's, no, there's no mandate on certification or licensure, no licensure laws. Yeah, the ISN certification is many of my students do take that exam um, and it can be, it requires a lot of grit to, you know, to take that exam that's timed and to become a certified sports nutritionist. Now, again, it varies state by state, you know, laws, but um, having that designation is another, you know, way to be able to speak on behalf of sports nutrition within your scope of practice, more particularly. All right, any other questions? All right, there's no more questions. So we're gonna wrap things up here. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you to Taps and Joanne. Thank you to everybody who attended today. Um, and yeah, have a fantastic rest of your day. We'll make sure we'll get, um, you'll be emailed out a, a link to this at some point. So you'll be able to rewatch if you are interested. But all right, thank you guys. Thank you all so much.